The opening round of the season took place at Nagaro in France two weeks ago. It was a WRT Audi lockout on the front row, but as the lights went green, the 38 Mercedes of Marc Basseng struggled to find a way through. Another man to get shuffled back in the pack was qualifying race podium finisher Albert von Turnen Taxis. He was 12th by the end of the first lap. It was a brilliant start, though, from the number one McLaren of Fred Makovicki. You can see here, as the lights go green up at the front, he gets a brilliant start, moves to the left-hand side and slices past most of the field before he even gets to the start line, hanging it on up the inside into turn one to move up into the top ten. The second McLaren was in trouble, Gregoire de Moussier getting forced out wide by Mike Parisi and losing a number of positions in the process. But the number one car of Fred Makovicki hardly made it past the second lap. He came straight into the pits with technical problems. Marc Basseng then picked his way past the AF Corsa Ferrari of Enzo Ede and his teammate would soon follow through. After 18 laps, Gregoire de Moustier retired the second McLaren and as the pit stop phases began, the Al Inkel squad got their Mercedes turned out very quickly indeed. Enzo Weed handed over to Francesco Castellacci in the number four Air of Corsa car, but it was a battle for the lead between the two WRT Audis. In the end, it was a slicker pit stop for the 33 machine, Oliver Jarvis exiting the pits just ahead of his teammate Laurence Van Thor, who'd taken over from Stefan Ortelli. With hotter tyres, Van Thor was soon on the attack, attempting a move around the outside at turn four. It didn't come off though, and the Belgian had to settle for second place for the time being. He then tried a lunge a few laps later, going down the back straight into the hairpin. But Jarvis was wise to it and managed to get the cutback to retain the lead. The battle would continue for the next few laps. But further back in the order, Thomas Engs was starting to make an impression, here getting past one of the BMWs to move up into the top ten. Van Thor then made the move stick for the lead down at the hairpin and would gradually begin to pull away from Oliver Jarvis. The Mercedes had moved themselves up into third and fourth with the two AF Corsa Ferraris in fifth and sixth. But it was the Stefan Ortelli and Oliver Jarvis car that exited the final corner to take the first win of the season in the championship race after winning the qualifying race yesterday, much to the delight of Frank Stippler and completing a WRT Audi whitewash of the weekend in Nagaro. An excellent drive from Peter Cox saw him recover to seventh place, but it was the WRT Belgian Audi club who dominated the opening round of the season. After a difficult opening weekend in Nagaro, Aston Martin are looking to bounce back here in Belgium. Andreas Zuber and Sergei Afanasiev were hampered by a lack of track time, but the seven car in the hands of Maxime Martin and Alexei Vasiliev showed good pace, and Max feels this weekend will be stronger for the DBRS9. I'm really happy to be here in Zolder in my home race with the Aston, where I think that the track is quite nice for the Aston, so I hope we can do quite not so bad. Audi's start to the 2012 championship was perfect. A 1-2 in both the qualifying and championship race leaves them as the team to beat. Oliver Jarvis and Frank Stippler will be pushing for the top step after two second places. And the Belgian Audi club run cars will also be hoping for a strong performance at their home circuit, with local man Laurens Van Thorp knowing exactly what the squad need to do to repeat their success in Nagaro. Well, it's my home race in Zolder, at 50 meters from here, so uh, we hope to do good. But we will do our, our job, work hard, try to not make any failures, and then we will get the result we deserve. Double GT1 champions, Vita for One racing team, endured a testing weekend in Nagaro, finishing 10th and 11th in the championship race. Things are looking better for Zolder, though, where the Z4 seems more at home after Friday practice. Any hopes of strong finishes will rely on GT ace Yelma Berman performing to the best of his abilities. Well, this is a real BMW track, so uh, hopefully with a new balance of performance we'll be aiming to get on the podium. Nagaro was a case of what might have been for Ferrari. The Italian mark had their strong drive pace hampered by rain in the qualifying race, then a drive-through penalty in the championship race. But Tony Valanda and Philippe Salacuada are once again looking like they're going to be at the sharp end this weekend. Francesco Castellacci will pilot the number four 458 alongside another man hoping his local knowledge will help him in Belgium, Enzo Ede. 
For this weekend's race, we will push like hell. We will try to get on the podium as this is my home track and uh, the car feels really great. Ford were battling against time to be prepared for the opening round of the season. But with a more settled crew, Matteo Crisoni is hoping that he and Milos Pavlovic can do a better job this weekend. We have worked a lot for after the first race. Uh, we have an uh, almost new car here. We hope to do a really good job. Writer Engineering once again showed their technical expertise in Nagaro, guiding the Lamborghini to a strong set of finishes. A brilliant drive in the championship race from Peter Cox to take seventh position on Easter Monday pleased the team. But it was the qualifying race heroics of Thomas Enger that took the plaudits. He climbed from seventh to first in the opening two laps. It's a beautiful circuit. We know the Lamborghinis uh, did well here last year. We hope to repeat the same. I'm really proud of my stint in qualifying race uh, in Ogaro. And I hope the conditions will be about uh, similar because we know in the uh, rain conditions, the Lambo is great. It may have been the home race for the Hexis team, but Nagaro was a weekend to forget for the French squad. Steph Dusseldorf crashed on the reconnaissance lap for the qualifying race, and neither machine managed to make it to the end of the championship race, as they both retired with technical problems. But Dusseldorf is confident the team can make amends. So we're here in Zolder, trying to put a good result after a difficult weekend in uh, Nogaro, but I'm sure with the home crowd and the home race, we can do a good result. The Mercedes were the best of the rest in Nogaro after Audi's domination. The Alinkle.com Munich Motorsports team left the French circuit second in the team's championship after Marc Basseng and Marcus Winkelhock guided their SLS AMG to third in the championship race. They took maximum points in last season's round at Zolder, albeit in the Lamborghini, but Thomas Jaeger thinks they can repeat that success this weekend. Yeah, we are here in Zolder. We have good memories from last year uh, when we started on pole position. Unfortunately, we didn't make it uh, to a win in the race, so hopefully we can do that uh, this year. Still need to gain a little bit of speed and uh, hopefully we do that tomorrow. Porsche 2 had a strong opening weekend and deserved more than their ninth place in the championship race. Mike Parisi starred at his home event and his teammate Matt Halliday is feeling positive ahead of the race. Well, this weekend here in, uh, in Zolder, we, uh, you know, we, we've been quick in practice. We're going to put our head down and try and uh, you know, carry through and get a good result. So, Saturday and Sunday where the points are, so hopefully it goes smooth. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Zolder for the qualifying race ahead of the second round of the FIA GT1 World Championship. We had dry weather earlier on today, but a short downpour just before we came on air means that the circuit is pretty wet indeed, and they're all going to be starting on the wet tyre, I have no doubt. My name is Jack Nichols up here in the commentary position. Down in the pit lane, we have Hayley Coxon, and alongside me in the commentary box, we have John Watson. And John, we weren't really expecting this weather. We were all set for a nice dry race, but then the heavens opened, as they so often do here. Thank goodness they have, Jack, because all I can say is wet to dry and we hope this will be a wet race that will go to dry you're going to see some well let's say sights that you may never have seen in a motor race before well we saw those kind of uh, conditions in Nagaro two weeks ago where we started our season in a month's time we're hoping not so much for rain in uh, in Spain and Navarra before the flyaways begin trips to China Russia and India finishing off the season at the start of December so let's hear from Peter Cox. He's going to be starting second on the grid today. Peter, the question is, can you beat the Audi to the first corner? Uh, I think it will be, uh, as always, very critical. And obviously the conditions change now just before the race, but they're the same for everybody. So just see if we can survive the first corner and the first few laps and then settle in. And then I think we should have a good race car. Thank you. Well, Thomas Enger was saying how strong the Lamborghini is in these wet conditions. I don't think the squad are going to be too disappointed with how the weather has transpired. Well, I think what Thomas was referring to was a race on a date in Nagaro. We're now in Zolder, different racetrack, different surface, different ambient. I mean, the whole thing is different. The only thing that's constant, in fairness to Thomas Enger, is it's raining. <laughs> so there's Sergei Afanasyev. He is going to be starting the Valmont Racing Team Russia car down in 16th position on the grid. Unfortunately, the Ford GT has had brake issues and they're going to fix them ahead of tomorrow's race. So 
it won't be out for the race today. Pole position for this race was taken in qualifying by the number nine X in Bank Team China Porsche of Matt Halliday and Mike Parisi, but they committed a pit stop infringement on the exit of the pit lane and have been docked three positions and will now start fourth on the grid. We'll give you a full rundown of the grid in a few moments time, but here's a McLaren that really struggled in qualifying, John. Alvaro Parent is going to be starting the number two Hexes car. Yeah, I mean, the Hexes McLaren's super team, super car, but McLaren have really got to resolve these issues. It's one thing running a Formula One team and all the technology there and the resource that goes into that, but GT racing is an entirely different aspect of motor racing and uh, just simply the ability to work on a car. Accessibility to the turbos, the buried right low down in the engine compartment of that McLaren, and there have been other issues as well. When that car is sorted, it will be hard to hold it back, but right now the Hexus team are working their hexes off to get that car capable of running competitively as well as getting to the end of the event. There's Alexei Vasiliev, he's going to be starting 13th position on the grid. He had a few little offs in qualifying, mainly down at turn 12, struggling to get the car stopped in what was a wet, dry session. There is the second Hexus Racing machine, 10th on the grid for Steph Dusseldorp starting that car. And they're in the number one car because they are the reigning champions, Hexus Racing. And uh, it is a, a real shame to see them struggling at the moment. Also, a little bit struggling in qualifying was uh, Nicky Mayer Mounhoff and Matthias Lauder, whilst their teammates qualified a little bit further up in the field. Uh, it's going to be 11th place on the grid for Nicky Mayer Mounhoff and Matthias Lauder starting that car. There, this is going to be interesting to watch Thomas Enger, as we mentioned earlier, storm through the field in the qualifying race at Nagaro. Similar conditions here at. Zolda, and he is going to look for a similar performance. Philippe Salacuada in the Ferraris. Worth pointing out the Ferraris struggle in the wet, don't they? Uh, well, they certainly did in Nagaro. Well, we saw that a little bit here as well because we've had wet running over the last couple of days. So the Ferrari in dry conditions, very quick car indeed. In these conditions, more of a handful. Never having said that, you can never discount a Ferrari from getting onto the podium. Seventh on the grid, the number 38 machine, Mark Basseng, is going to be starting the Alinkle.com Munich Motorsports Mercedes AMG SLS. And he's very much getting in the zone. There is Mike Parisi's Porsche that we mentioned earlier. Qualified it on pole position, Matt Halliday uh, did. But then they were docked three positions, but still fourth place, pretty impressive. Then we've got our current championship leaders, Stefan Ortelli and Laurence Van Thor. It's going to be Stefano Ortelli starting this race and uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how quickly he can progress up the order and then we're on to the front row. The man we spoke to a few moments ago, Peter Cox, the Dutchman, looking at a clear road in front of him and the only car near him is the one alongside him on pole position. That's the 37 Al Inkle car of Nicky Pastorelli. He's third on the grid, so he's on the second row alongside the, uh, the Team China Porsche. But then, our pole position driver, 2005 Formula Renault UK champion, 2006 British F3 runner-up, Oliver Jarvis, starting the Belgian Audi Club Team WRT R8 LMS Ultra. And uh, it's going to be great for the Belgian Audi Club if they can pull off a performance at their home circuit. Well, in particular, Oli, Oliver Jarvis was, I know, disappointed in Nagaro. He got the lead of the race. Frank Stripper handed the car over to Oliver. But then, three-quarters way through the second stint, then, the sister car got ahead, and uh, after the race, you could see the look on Oliver's face. He just was so basically gutted that they'd lost the lead. They got on the podium second place, but you know, a racing driver isn't going to be satisfied, particularly when you're in a dominant position, as those two uh, Belgium Auto Club, ID Auto Club cars were in the Garrow. So wet conditions, wet start, and everybody will be guaranteed on wet tyres. Yeah, there's no uh, chance of slicks just yet, but how quickly will this circuit dry out? We saw in qualifying that after, well, the first two sessions, so 35 minutes it took for the track to dry out once the cars got running, which is about the same time as we're going to be seeing the pit stop windows. Yeah, the, the, the ambient temperature has never really gone above 10 Celsius. Track temperature about the same as it was four hours ago, 16 and a half Celsius. So the, the, the support that you might expect from the ambient ain't there. There's a little bit of wind blowing, but it seems to come and go with the rain. 
So it's going to take probably the best part of this first 25 minutes to get anywhere near the possibility of running on the set of sticks. So the cars head off on their formation lap around this 4.1 kilometre solder circuit. This first corner is going to be interesting. The spray is going to be interesting as well because it's concrete walls all the way around most of this circuit here. And I think the spray is going to really hang in the air, a bit like we saw in Korea in the Formula One. If you've got concrete walls there, it all hangs. Yeah, I mean, for some of the drivers, they will have raced last weekend at Monza in the Blancpain series, and where they had appalling conditions for the entirety of that race. So there, in a sense, rain eye will be in. But again, this is a different circuit to Monza. You've got the proximity of barriers much more than you would maybe at the, the, the more traditional Monza road circuit. Uh, nevertheless, in these conditions, opening lap, opportunities to take advantage, but worst of all, opportunities just to drop a big turn. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be a, a very, very big challenge for these drivers coming down into the first corner. It's a, uh, it's a pretty late apex down there at turn one, and we've seen plenty of cars, and also there's some fairly unforgiving gravel on the exit. If you go off at turn one, you're going to lose a lot of time, if not be out of the race. Well, the nature of the run down into turn one, as you point out, it is a late apex. Therefore, it invites the brave to dive down the inside to try and take away the position from a car close to you. But in doing so, you've got to be very careful not to overrun the corner and then run wide into the cars that are on the more traditional racing line. Interesting start into turn one at Zolder. Last year, we saw incident before we even got to turn one. Let's please have a clean start and get all these cars run one lap without any contact. Yeah, that's certainly what we're all hoping for. The GT1 guys were very, very well behaved in Nagara. We saw some excellent racing, close racing, but I don't remember a, a single piece of contact in either of the two races at Nagara. There's Sergei Afanasyev. They had to change the gearbox in that car after qualifying. He went out and had troubles. There's the number four um, AF Corsa Ferrari, Francesco Castellacci. Now, we saw one going up the hill slowly, didn't we, on the reconnaissance lap, so I wonder if there's some technical gremlins there. Oh, well, they certainly didn't make it around onto their grid proper uh, on the actual grid itself, so he will start, as you say, from pit lane, and he can't really roll until the last car in this grid more than likely it'll be the uh, Aston Martin, the Valmont Racing Team Russia Aston Martin. So until it goes past the end of the pit lane, the Ferrari's got to sit there, and that's a frustration for Francesco Castellacci. So, and I'll have a bit of Parmesan with that, please, as well. So they line up in two-by-two two formation. This is on board with uh, Mark Basseng. Looking back, you can see the McLaren behind him. And... Uh, this 16 car field is about to start a one hour race here at Zolder in very wet, very slippery, very difficult conditions. Pole position will be Oliver Jarvis in the 33 Audi. He will have the inside line and the ideal line going down into the first corner. He's dropped back a little bit. He's waiting to back the field up. And as we wait for the lights to go out here at Zolder, the cars are looking for them. The race is underway and it's a very good start from Peter Cox. He is immediately into the lead. Mike Parisi looking to the inside immediately already. Also, Thomas Jaeger having a look at the inside. That's a good move from him. Are they all going to make it through turn one safely? It does look like it at the moment as they exit. Peter Cox leads, Oliver Jarvis is in second, and third position at the moment, I apologise, it's not Thomas Yeager, it's his teammate Nicky Pastorelli starting that car. Three wide coming into turn two, McLaren, the sandwich in that Lamborghini Ferrari. So, Brian Aldaro tries to get the car into clear, well, you can't see anything, it's absolutely zero visibility. And not a very good start for Ren Wei, you can see there at the back in the Exim Bank Team China Porsche, but Peter Cox it is, who leads down to the first chicane, and here comes Nicky Pastorelli on the attack against Oliver Jarvis, He's not close enough to make the move. Will Jarvis be able to get the car stopped in time? Yes, he can. Almost contact behind, real side-by-side -side racing as they exit down through the descending turn seven. Now, who was that between? Yelmar Thomas Bowman. Enger. Thomas no. Enger's made a great start. Yeah, but they've gone to the BMWs with side-by-side. That was Yelmar Benman. So there he's dropped now behind the Porsche. That's the car driven right now by Mike Parisi. So Parisi had a good initial getaway, was up to third on the run down into turn one, but has now dropped a few places and is now down, I think, in sixth or seventh position. We'll wait for confirmation at the end of the first lap, and Parisi is coming under pressure now from Yelma Berman on the run down into turn 12. Is he going to be close enough? Parisi covers the inside line, and there's no way through for Yelma Berman just yet, but Steph Dusseldorf is right behind in that McLaren as they come down. 
to the final chicane at turns 15 and 16 to complete the first lap and Peter Cox is pulling away a little bit there's been a swap between the Mercedes hasn't there Mark Basseng is now up into third place ahead of Nicky Pastorelli and the second of those Lamborghinis Thomas Enger he's made his way up for the fourth row of the grid into fifth place Across the line they come then, Peter Cox leads in the Lamborghini, second place is Oliver Jarvis, it's Mark Basseng in third position. Fourth place is his teammate Nicky Passarelli and Thomas Enger in fifth, sixth is Mike Parisi. And then you've got the rest of the field, Stefano Telly had a difficult start, he's dropped down to ninth position after uh, starting in fifth place, so that's not gone well. Berman is past Mike Parisi now, up into sixth position, so that move must have happened down there at turn one and will Berman now start to pull away Parisi was saying he was desperate for dry conditions in that Porsche it, uh, it hasn't worked out I don't understand why they feel the Porsche isn't going to work in these conditions as well as it works relative to others in the dry but the lead now slight consolidation Lamborghini Audi Mercedes of the three cars you have to think that maybe it is Mark Bassing in that Mercedes Benz SLS who probably is quicker than the two cars ahead but right now drivers just really accustomizing to the change in these conditions much much more demanding than it was this morning when the track was damp now it is a full wet racetrack and you'll get a different reaction from the wet weather tire to those of this morning it's not going to be long before Mark Basseng has a look at second place I think because he is looking very very racy the wet conditions as Laurent Van Thor watches on his teammate down in ninth place but uh, Basseng was telling me that the brakes in the Mercedes are a bit of a trouble. It's a heavy braking circuit, but these wet conditions, they're going to use the brakes less. They'll use the brakes less. They'll be earlier on the brake. It'll not be such an aggressive application of the brake pedal. But of course, nevertheless, whatever you do in a race car, if you're marginal in the dry, it's not going to be massively better in the wet. And it's always in the back of your mind when you hit the brake pedal, will I have a strong pedal or a long pedal? Well, look at the gap that Peter Cox has built up on that previous lap. It's now 1.4 seconds. Oliver Jarvis, I think, is really backing the pack up. Yelma Berman, meanwhile, did the fastest first and second sectors of anyone in that last lap. And Nicky Pastorelli goes wide. Is this a chance for Thomas Enger to stick it around the outside into turn two? He loves the outside in the wet, doesn't he? Well, I mean, that was an easy pass because Nicky Pastorelli got on the curb on the exit of turn one. Yelmar Bowman's also gotten past that Mercedes Benz. So in the case of space of two corners, the second of the two Mercedes has gone from fourth down to sixth place. That gives Mark Basseng a little bit of breathing room now so he can just focus on attacking Oliver Jarvis, which he is doing down into the chicane. Not close enough, tried to sell Jarvis a little bit of a dummy. This is all allowing Peter Cox just to get away up at the front. How long will it be before Thomas Enger tries to make his way past the, uh, what begins to close in, I should say, Mark Basseng up in front, but at the moment we're watching this battle. Four second position, Peter Cox leads, the Audi in second, the Mercedes in third, and then we've got this fourth and fifth battle, Yelma Berman starting to put Thomas Enger under pressure. Well, I think that the BMW is the car to keep an eye on in this lead group of six cars. Berman did a strong job in the opening lap. There we see his teammate and team boss as we look at the battle for second place coming down into turn 12. Nice wide line being taken in by Mark Basseng. We ride on board as he tries to hunt down Oliver Jarvis in front of him. This is down towards the final chicane on the circuit, turns 15 and 16. Nothing between these two cars and acceleration. The balance of performance in that particular party between these two cars. Oh. In fact, the Lamborghini making a mistake. Yeah. The idea also sort of getting caught up in it, but Mark Basseng not really anticipating it enough to be able to take advantage of it, but goes down the right-hand side of the pit straight, hoping to get a better entry into turn two, and on the exit, he might well be able to put himself just ahead of Oliver Jarvis in the Audi. There we see the onboard shot, and I run out of breath, but Jarvis consolidates, keeps second place. Well, I didn't see what happened to Peter Cox coming down into the chicane, but there must have been it was some on the, of... It was more on the exit, and just got that a little it. bit, a little flick of the back of the car. That backed up Oliver Jarvis, gave Mark Bassang the opportunity now Oliver Jarvis focusing on the car, the Lamborghini ahead, but mindful of what's going on behind. And Mark Bassang has got a sense and a scent of second place. And Yelma Berman and Thomas Enger are closing in on them as well. So it's pretty much a five-way scrap for the lead at the moment. Here comes Yelma Berman up the inside into turn five. He's through and he gets it stopped. So Berman up into fourth position then. And he's going to be on the back of these top three before too long. Well, the key for Yelma Berman will be momentum. 
He's gotten past quickly the Lamborghini of Thomas Enger. He's going to close rapidly to the tail of these three cars ahead of him. What he needs to try and do is maintain that momentum and not get stalled to the speed of those three cars ahead. And the danger is, if it happens at a part of the racetrack where overtaking is possible, and it is coming down into turn 12, but he's not in position. Hang back that little bit to enable yourself to pick up the momentum coming out of turn 12. Then the little flip left, back to the right, then the run up to turns 15 and 16. If he can get that BMW under the rear wing of the Mercedes-Benz, he might be brave enough to dive up the inside. Marcus Vingelhock watching on as Mark Basset, well, he'll have seen that BMW close up so quickly in his mirrors that he will know he needs to put a buffer between the two of them, and he's going to try and get past Oliver Jarvis as soon as he can across the line they come. It's still Peter Cox leading. The gap is just 0.8 seconds, and then it's a further four tenths of a second back. And... Uh, to Mark Basseng. So they come into oh, a little oh, bit wide for Basseng. Yes, is this Berman's opportunity? Yes, same that, as that happened back with the, the other Mercedes a few moments ago. We saw the same thing with Nicky Pastorelli running wide in the exit of turn one, consequently losing momentum. Berman was all over it like a rash, but wasn't quite far enough forward to be able to take it as a position. Into the right hander then. And Yelma Berman is going to be having a look, I think, before too long, possibly even down into Turn 5 if he's close enough. He has a little look up the inside, but uh, not quite enough room, just trying to put Mark Basseng off, but they're all getting stacked up behind Jarvis still. Yeah, but, I mean, but oh, Yelma Berman in the BMW thought he had a shot into Turn 5. Mark Basseng shut that door uh, and made no choice. Berman had to get out of it and uh, wait, so that is the difficulty that all three cars behind the lead Lamborghini of Peter Cox are facing who can get past who at which part of the track and you're going to have to deal with a defensive driver on the one hand but equally he's being attacking on the other so down in towards turn 12 once more Mark Basseng having a little look up the inside every single time just trying to distract Oliver Jarvis but it's not working and it's probably not going to work Jarvis is an experienced enough campaigner to know when he's being uh, tricked into a mistake. The other thing is the BMW were very unhappy after Nagaro. They claimed a bit of relief on the balance of performance. They were granted that, and that's part of the reason. It's not the total reason, but that's part of the reason why the BMW here is showing much more strongly uh, than it did two weeks ago in Nagaro. Across the line they come. Peter Cox's lead is now up to 1.2 seconds, so he's slowly starting to edge away. Got a nice battle there going on between Parisi and uh, Nicky Pastorelli. Then we've got the McLaren of Steph Dusseldorf on the outside of Matthias Lauda trying to go all the way around the outside. That's going to be a brave one, Steph. He has to concede and ultimately loses the position I mean, to that, Philippe Salaquada. Yeah, I mean, he, he put himself into that position. Nobody else. He was on the outside coming down the pit lane, and uh, there was never a chance of that uh, BMW conceding to the McLaren. As Nicholas Meyer Meinhof has a look and keeps an eye on what is young Austrian, well, he's all, he could be Austrian, Spanish, Chilean, or German. In the Lauda family, it could be in one of those four. Out of turn five and six, they come, and Yama Berman is looking closer than ever to the back of Mark Basseng. I wondered if he was going to have a lunge up the inside into the chicane, but he wasn't close enough. And this is allowing, if these two start battling, Oliver Jarvis will be pleased because he can start to edge clear as well. Fastest lap of the race, Stefan Ortelli, who has made his way up into eighth position now and is beginning to close in on Mike Parisi in front of him. So Stefan Ortelli, championship leader, along with his teammate Lawrence Van Thor, are uh, certainly a car to keep an eye on as well, they come through turn 12. I mean, the thing with Ortelli is being all the way down in eighth place, he's got a bit of clear air ahead of him and he's got clear air behind him so he is able to simply just drive the racetrack as he chooses what we're seeing here with the Audi, the Mercedes, the BMW and the Lamborghini is they're all basically fighting for second place and every one of them feels it's their entitlement to be there Oliver Jarvis has got it he's not going to give it up no not without a fight that's for sure across the line they come once more and the spray is looking uh, better this time around as Berman flashed his lights desperate to try and find a way past we go back on board with Mark Basseng looking to the BMW behind us and he's later on the brakes it seems and he's hugging the apex a lot more through turn three as well so it looks as though that BMW is handing a lot lot better through the corners and it's got a good run off turn three can he get down the inside into turn four he looks to go down the inside oh. side by side we're on board with the Mercedes but look Mark Bazin just braves it out and maintains third 
Down into the chicane they come, Basseng covering the inside line in case there's a late move from the BMW, but there is not one. Well, I think Yelma Berman's going to have to man up a bit more than we're seeing him doing right now. That was an opportunity in turn four. You're not going to get too many of those, so take it, make it, and move on. They're, they're starting to uh, drop Thomas Engap. You can just see behind on this uh, onboard camera. He's Mounted probably laughing his head off watching all this action. He doesn't need to get involved in that action. If these two guys are going to go eyeball to eyeball, all he's going to do is sit there and watch them do it, and then he'll pick up the pieces and move forward. So there's our race leader, Peter Cox, just disappearing out of sight as the cars break for turn 12, and Berman's going for it up the inside. No, he's not. That was a that was a late decision to have a little stab, and then he backed out of it quickly. But also, Mark Bassang was aware that the BM was having a lunge down the inside. He gave the BMW room yep. to get around the corner and avoided contact, and that's what you've got to do in these close battles, is not just watch ahead of you, but keep an eye on the driver who is challenging from behind. And all of this, despite these two battling, they're still not losing sight of Oliver Jarvis in front as they come across the line to complete lap seven. Into turn one we come, and we can see once again, well, less uh, spectacularly in that shot, but we've seen how strong the BMW is around this sequence of corners. Berman will know that now, and will try and get Basseng out of position. This is exactly the shot we watched from before as they came into turn four. But the Mercedes has managed to take another 10 metres or so out of the BMW, not even look like five metres. The BMW not able to get as close to the Mercedes into turn four as one lap ago. But you know, you can't continually drive under the rear wing of another car. You've got to drop back that little bit. Look where you're strong, look where your competitor's not so strong, and try and bring those two elements together. But right now, Yelmar Bowman in the BMW dropping back further than we've seen him do in the last two or so laps. Yeah, perhaps Mark Basseng is just starting to get the hang of it. And uh, Mark Basseng, well, let's ask his teammate, Marcus Finkelhock, what he thinks is going on in this race. Marcus, can Mark hold him up? Um, yeah, he's trying the best. I think the car is not too bad. He had a great start coming from seven uh, to third place after the first corner. The uh, car seems to be competitive. And uh, yeah, at the moment, he's doing a good job. I hope he can keep the position and uh, yeah I think the only thing what we can hope as well is that we have a good pit stop and then I think it should be alright. Thank you. There's a, a, a slippery surface flag out on the run down into the final corner and I wonder if that's because one of the Team China Porsches has just pulled into the pit lane, Ren Wei, so I wonder if he has a bit of a problem. We're still now watching the uh, other Al Inkel car, Nicky Pastorelli, still holding off Mike Parisi, but still, it's only just. There was only a tenth of a second between them as they crossed the line last time, and now Parisi's got the inside line, and he's made it through, and Mike Parisi moves up into fifth position because has Thomas Enger uh, got some sort of problem there, John? Well, he suddenly just dropped back from the group of cars he was running in. We did see him drop back a little bit. I thought it might have been just Thomas enjoying himself, but clearly there's a problem with that. Thomas Enger, Albert, T and T, von Turner and von Texas, He's out of it. It's now the Porsche that's made its way up into sixth place. And so, oh, a bit of uh, damage there on the back of Renway's cart. So he must have had a little trip into the scenery, I wonder. Well, Renway was fine for going the wrong way in practice, and it uh, looks like he got it Renway, he got it wrong way. <laughs> certainly does. So hopefully they can repair that car uh, for tomorrow. As into the chicane at turn eight comes Oliver Jarvis still in that second position. Now it'll be interesting to see whether Mike Parisi in that Porsche could catch up quickly. There's Thomas Enger then. So that last lap, was a, he lost five seconds on that last lap, so maybe it was just a mistake. No, it wasn't. It was. It looked to me, well, it, it appeared we saw the car dropping back fractionally, then all of a sudden on the pit straight it just went backwards, and everybody was coming forward. There may have been a, a, a problem within the car. He had to do a reset on some of the computers to get the car to run. Maybe just simply water's got into some of the electronics. We don't know. We'll maybe be able to find out a bit more from the team at the point when we go within, well, we've got about just a nine minutes before the pit lane window opens, and it will remain open for a further ten. So, again, it's going to be interesting. If the, if the pit stop windows are open now, they wouldn't change to slick tyres, I have no doubt. But 10 or 15 minutes before they have to make a pit stop, there's always a chance that someone a little bit further back might take a little gamble. Um, Stefano Telli has also got past Thomas Enger on that last lap, as has Matthias Lauda, as has Steph Dusseldorf, as has Philippe Salaquada. So I wonder where Thomas Enger is. He hasn't 
Uh, well, he's in the pit past. lane. He's in the pit lane, is he? Yeah, there's the cars Oh, yeah, there in. he is. So, so uh, well, we're hoping to find out from the team what was Thomas Inger's problem, but nevertheless, the sister car has now pulled a gap of, well, it's 2.2 seconds when they came across the start-finish line at the end of lap nine, and now, for the first time, really, Peter Cox is getting clear air. If you see the Lamborghini directly behind the Porsche, the Porsche, in effect, blocking the pit lane as it's trying to get it jacked up, removed into the garage. Peter Cox leads, but this is still the three-way battle over second position. On that last lap, Mike Parisi, uh, I think he was still overtaking on that last lap, and it sounds like it's a gearbox problem for a Lamborghini. That's a very unusual failure. Of course, pedal shift gear changes on all these cars. Thomas Enger out. That's huge disappointment for the Czech driver. The uh, great fun to watch and the great driver. Let's hear what they've got to say. Thomas, can you tell us what's going on with the car? Uh, well, we don't know at this moment. I can't describe it. I've never uh, uh, experienced that. Just like problem with the gearbox, shifting, electronic, some glitches we have there, and uh, I don't know what it is. We have to look at it. Thank you. Well, that's a real shame for uh, that team. Uh, there's a car. There's the start for Peter Cox and Oliver Jarvis. Both of them are under investigation. It was a well. The reason was that the car in pole position, the, the car currently in second place, was not the car that was in the lead when the, the lights went out, and that happened to be the, the car that presently is leading, the Peter Cox Darrell, a young Lamborghini. So I, I'm not surprised it's under investigation because you're not meant to overtake until you've passed the point of where the lights go out. So um, fight about it afterwards, but currently it's under investigation. And Oliver Jarvis is still coming under investigation from Mark Basseng right up behind him, as close as he has been in the last few laps as they crest the hill at turn seven through this sweeping left-hander, the iconic shot of Zolder, really, the uh, dip down under that bridge as they head through turns eight and nine now. And Yelma Berman's attack has started to wane somewhat. Mike Parisi on that last lap took seven-tenths of a second out of this uh, battle up in front. And he's now also got the single fastest lap, one minute, 42.628. So Mike Parisi beginning to make a little bit of progress towards the tail of this trio. And, uh, well, we've got, what, uh, four minutes or so before the pit stop window opens. Into the final chicane. And uh, these three are struggling to make heads or tails of any kind of opening, any overtaking opportunity. And you just wonder if Mike Parisi, because he's got a bit of a run-up coming into this, is he going to be able to carry the momentum uh, that you know if you get stuck behind someone in a groove if you are fresh to it and you can just come straight in and attack it can be an advantage well that's what I expected the BMW of Yelmer Bowman to be able to do he yeah. came very quickly to the tail of that group of cars wasn't able to make the overtake and he's now got stalled out in that position in that fourth position the Porsche running it down lapping what about a second and a bit quicker per lap but the problem that Mike Parisi will face is the same as Yelmer Bowman if you can't get close very quickly, then you also will become just a further doppelganger to the chain of three cars that we've already got fighting over third. Plenty of Ferrari fans out there, but unfortunately they are currently running in 10th and 11th places. Philippe Salacuada ahead of Francesco Castellacci, and they are both behind Steph Dusseldorp in 9th position. So these conditions, we feared they wouldn't really work out well for the Ferraris. And, uh, well, at the start of this season, we didn't really anticipate watching Ferraris and McLarens battle over 11th and 12th places, but that's what's going on at the moment as they come through the little oh, and kick I mean, out the back of the pits. Yeah, just watching the McLaren coming through the chicane there. I mean, it, both the Ferrari and the McLaren don't look as compliant in these tricky conditions as the cars further up the field. And again, we saw one week ago when the wet conditions at Monza, just how difficult it was. So here's the start again. Now, Peter Cox was comfortably ahead yes but this is but this isn't actually the start but Jarvis didn't seem to catch up Jarvis didn't seem well, it, to, it, to it, be alongside yeah but it's, it's not his responsibility well, yeah, exactly. it's, it's, Who's responsibility Peter Cox should have dropped back yeah and so there you can see as they cross the start line Peter Cox was comfortably uh, in front of Oliver Jarvis but of course that's one for the stewards to decide they're gonna love it something to get their teeth into <laughs> 
bring them both in and give them a right good talking to and on top of that slap them with a fine and probably a few pace drop yeah the, the, so <laughs> give them the, the through the whole book of them <laughs> so then uh, uh, fantastically everyone else made uh, it round the first few corners cleanly there are the two alinkle drivers thomas jaeger closest to camera and marcus winkelhock furthest away and uh, they are watching on before they can take over. The gap is coming down yep. up at the front, though. Peter Cox did have a 2.2 second advantage a couple of laps ago. He lost seven tenths of a second on that previous lap to Oliver Jarvis. Yeah, that gap has closed on. It's closed on by a second. Uh, I wonder whether that's Oliver Jarvis speeding up. Well, he appears to have done so. He was half a second a lap quicker on that last lap than the lead car was. That would only account for half of the one second so I think that Oliver Jarvis has found a little bit more pace in these conditions than the lead Lamborghini is doing it's dropping back into the middle of one minute 43 second lap Mike Parisi is now within a second of Yelma Berman for fourth position as well you can see the Exim Bank team China Porsche coming down the hill and closing in all the while it seems you can visibly see how much quicker that Porsche is lapping that last lap well uh, was some nine tenths of a second quicker on that last lap well, very impressive so i wonder if the circuit is well it is undoubtedly drying a little bit and whether that's starting to play into the hands of the porsche i think it's primarily because mike parisi has been able to drive his own line accelerate when he wants to break turn when he wants to very quickly pulling over to the wetter part of that pit straight to ensure that the wet weather tower is getting the maximum cooling at once but now it really is within a second maybe less than a second of the fourth place bmw and that been dropping back in the last lap or so from the third place mercedes mike parisi uh, we saw him racing very aggressively in nagaro making some bold maneuvers on plenty of cars actually i would i would i would hazard a guess that he was the driver who overtook the most last time out in nagaro the 2004 formula france champion Runner-up in FIA GT3 last year in a Mercedes has stepped up to GT1 this year and is performing very, very well indeed, even though that, as I said earlier, that ninth place in Nagara not really representative of their pace. Well, it's interesting. Third and fourth have suddenly upped their pace into the high one minute 42s. Drive-through penalty for car 25, and that is our race leader jumping the start. You know, Rocket Scientist would have worked that one out. Shame for the race, shame for Peter Cox, but... You must not overtake the car beside you. But in particular, if it's the guy on the front row of the grid who is the pole sitter. Yeah, I, I think that's the, the thing for Peter Cox, isn't it? Because it's not as though he was in the mid-pack and you can never quite really tell who is who. He was on the front row of the grid. And uh, I imagine the stewards' opinion is that there is probably very little excuse as we tick down towards the uh, here comes Mike Parisi is he going to send one into the final chicane no he's not but he's right on the back of Yelma Berman but uh, but yeah the stewards thinking that Peter Cox has very little excuse for that even though he is a very very experienced driver he's been racing cars since well he was the 1982 Dutch karting champion so that's how long he's been racing second in Dutch Formula Ford in 1984 and uh, all the way up to being ADAC GT Masters champion in 2010. So an experienced driver, you don't really expect to start like that from him. No, and I, I don't know why Peter Cox would have fallen for that sucker punch in a way, because the Oliver Jarvis did what he was required to do under the rules. He brought the field around the final turn, and then the Lamborghini just ran ahead, and then when the, the race got underway, he had the best part of a full car length advantage over the second-place car we see, Oliver Jarvis, who will, within the space of, what, two more laps, be the lead car other than if he decides at the earliest opportunity and that opportunity could be at the end of this lap because the pit lane window is now Pierre Dupasque who is the boss the man in charge of this Belgian ID club team he will control the what's going he will say Oliver Jarvis pit 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 or no use the advantage that you may well have for the Lamborghini the Lamborghini is also just suddenly slowed right down forcing the Audi to back up which will allow the Mercedes to come back into contention and the BMW and the Porsche on the brakes into turn 12 and Oliver Jarvis is he gonna I mean I imagine De Pasquier was on the radio saying you know you don't need to overtake this guy he's going to take a drive-through penalty before too long 
Is he going to take it this time around, Peter Cox? Yep, in he comes. So Peter Cox moves into the pit lane, giving Oliver Jarvis the lead of this race, the lead of the qualifying race here at Zolda. But right up behind him is uh, the Alain Gould Mercedes, and side by side is Yama Berman and Mike Parisi. We know the Porsche is good in the straight line, and Parisi's through up into what is now third position past Yama Berman almost instantly, but when he got up to the back of it. Well, you know. A car with an engine hanging out behind the rear axle. When it comes to traction off a low-speed corner, you've got to think it's going to get the advantage, and that's what Mike Parisi did. Just was able to get the squirt down where the BMW was having just to be a little bit more cautious on the throttle. Peter Cox has carried out his drive-through penalty. Now, be careful on the exit of the pit lane. Don't run over that white line, because you'll be back in the pit lane once again if you do so. Where's he going to come out? Just behind uh, the Steph Dusseldorf McLaren. So it's 10th place, I believe, for Peter Cox. And well, he's still in a shot with some points because he's going to have more pace than the drivers in front. But uh, whether he can climb too far back up the order remains to be seen. There's Daryl O'Young. It looks like they're going to get him in the car fairly soon. We've already got a pit stop for Philippe Salacuada. Tony Volander is going to take over, and those are wet tyres going on. It's nowhere near dry enough for, uh, for well, I mean, The, the, the conditions we've got now are, are not dissimilar from those that we had much earlier in the day when the track was wet from overnight rain. The standing water has gone. You can see a, the hint of a drying line as the cars come out of turn 12 through 13 and 14 but it's the rest of the circuit where the problem lies. You will get at certain points damage to the front of that Mercedes. There's one of those little parts of the support for the Mercedes star slightly arrayed. I don't know whether that was a contact or something just happened to uh, detach. In the meantime, the sister car running a little bit further down the field with Nicky Passarelli in sixth place. So across the line they come, and on that last lap, Mike Parisi took uh, only a tenth of a second out of Mark Basseng, but he was busy overtaking. Basseng set the fastest first sector of anyone on that last lap. Parisi set the fastest middle sector of anyone on that last lap. So I think Oliver Jarvis, when he hands over to Frank Stippler, Stippler's going to have a lot of pressure on his shoulders. And Matt Halliday prepared in the pits to jump into this car Mike Parisi doing a good job, got that up now into third place. Remember, they had fastest lap of everybody, but then he got penalised, so it had to start on the second row of the grid in fourth place, dropped way back in the beginning, now up into third place, and still, I would say, the quickest car on the track at the minute. Yep, it, uh, it's going to be very interesting. Although, actually, on that last lap, Oliver Jarvis set the fastest lap of the race out the front, so that's impressive from... Uh, from Oliver, he's pulled out three tenths of a second now over Mark Basseng, so perhaps conditions, whoa, big slide from Basseng on the exit of turn 10, keeps it all together nicely though, as we uh, look at the dissension down into turn 7, this is a battle between a McLaren and a BMW, it's uh, Matthias Lauda coming under pressure from Steph Dusseldorp over 7th position now, although I think that is because some of the Ferraris have pitted, but it's not going to be long before Dusseldorf is passed because Lauda is all over the shop, and through he goes up the inside. Yeah, Matt Mateus Lauda had a real handful with his BMW, and Steph Dusseldorf saw that one easily. But Lauda's thinking about coming back, tries to get down the long way, then cuts back to the, the traditional racing line. Dusseldorf is offline, but has managed to slow both those cars down to enable him when he gets back on the power to compromise any chance Lauda might have had at making a switchback. Now, moving around like that is not actually what you're permitted to do. You go from left, right over to left, and back again. I think that's very marginal. The stewards will look at it. Whether they decide to do anything about it is another matter. Frank Stippler not getting ready, walking over to the pit wall instead to just check on the lap times, and I think he'll be happy because Oliver Jarvis, uh, sorry, Mike Parisi set the fastest lap of the race on that last lap, a full second quicker than Oliver Jarvis in front of him. So that's a, a very impressive lap time indeed. No, sorry, it wasn't. It was Alvaro Parente, I apologise. PAA is Parente as opposed to PAM of Parisi. So uh, it was Alvaro Parente down in ninth position. Slicks going on yes, through the Peter Cox, Darrell O'Day. Lamborghini, that is a brave move. It'll be either the winning move or it'll be the sucker punch. Well, they've got nothing to lose, have they? It's going to be wet going on to the Audi of Oliver Jarvis, who's going to hand over to Frank Stippler. But, yeah, good spot there, John. Slick tyres definitely going on. As we wait to see what the uh, Audi team will decide to do, because it, 
There is a dry, you can see the dry line, can't you? There's no doubt that there, it is drying out there, but everyone is going to hold fire, I would say, for four minutes to see what these sector times are like. Well, Darrell Young going out on a set of slick tyres in tricky conditions. You know, you wouldn't really ask your best enemy to do it, let alone your teammate. <laughs> he will have to be cautious, but maybe because he's not been out on the track, he will go out and uh, have nothing, nothing to compare. He will just use his knowledge experience as the second of those Audis makes its way in. I wonder if they're going to try and pull the same trick, the 32 Audi, because they are well down uh, in about ninth position they were before the pit stop started. So I wonder if they'll fancy giving Laurence Vanthor a nice, uh, a nice set of slick tyres. He adjusts the mirror, begins to undo his belts as he gets ready to pull into the pit lane and those look like wet it's to hard to tell you couldn't get a good enough glimpse as we came past to see whether they're going to put on a set of wets to that we'll car or not wets, wets yep. indeed so wets going back on for Lawrence van Thor. where's darlow young he has just come out the pits he hasn't gone through the second sector yet fastest middle sector of anyone is alvaro parente so he is uh, he is flying at the moment in the number two car he started the car so I don't really understand where that pace has instantly come from well, for Alvaro. The only thing that you can say is track conditions have improved substantially and it just may be that it's enabling the McLaren to put the energy into the car to use the potential as McLaren. I mean, this is the car that everybody feared coming into GT1 that it would just wipe the board because it is the nearest thing to a pure racing car. Carbon fibre tub, all the... Uh, oh, very close to that white line as they came back out. Hopefully that wasn't a problem. Well, Laurel, well, he should know that. He overlooks that corner from his bedroom window. Indeed, into the pits Oliver comes in. Oliver Jarvis and second place and third place. Now, the interesting thing to note there was Darrell Young in the Lamborghini was right up behind Oliver Jarvis and was putting him under some decent pressure. Young comes across the line, a 40.9 middle sector, four seconds off the pace, 32.5 final sector, two seconds off the pace. So... It, are any of these teams, I don't think there are any of them are going to take the risk. I think it's very unlikely. You, if the majority go with one set of tyres and you're the odd one out, well, then there's a reason for that. If 50-50 go slicks wet with the tyres, then you roll your dice and you decide if you go back to the Audi and let's have a look at the sweats going on to that. The sun's trying to break through, but all around the circuit we've got black clouds. So really, it's almost like a punter's slicks. decision. Slicks on, slicks the on the Porsche. Exactly what they did in qualifying. And Matt Halliday was the man that was behind the wheel when they did that in qualifying. Fantastic. So, and it slicks on the Mercedes as well. So we really have got a 50-50 split. Who is going to have taken the tactical gamble and made it pay off out of the pits then comes Frank Stippler he's on the wet tyres a very slick why, pit stop why did Audi not take the chance to put one on wets and one on dries you know yeah. if you go if you commit to both cars on wets either both are going to be wrong or possibly both might be right whereas you've got two cars you can afford to take a chance with one of them as we see the 32 car come round that's the Van Thor car on his slick tyres completing his first lap of this track in these conditions. OK, so the pit stop window closes in 40 seconds' time. I think we've had all of the big players come into the pits. Uh, Steph Dusseldorp hasn't yet, but I think that's the only one. There you can see the 18 car now in the hands. We've also got one of the Aston Martins coming in now, but they've already had a pit stop. That must be Zuber and Afanasiev. Yes, it is. So Andreas Zuber changing... They're on, on to slicks as well. Yeah, because they're not going to have anything to lose. Here's the McLaren now. It's got to come in. It is coming in. So Alvaro Perez stayed out until the very last moment. He left it with 12, 10, 12 seconds to get into the pit lane. He's got to get over that white line. And he does it with... Well, how is that for cutting it yeah, fine? That's, that's, I think that's why Dusseldorp was pushing, wasn't it? Because uh, he knew he had to make it back to the pit lane. But that's... And watch this Hexus pit stop because they have been so strong that the Ferrari clearly is on wets because it's running down the left-hand side of the pit straight looking for any bit of racetrack where there's moisture. Oh, and there's all sorts of splashing going on down there in the pit lane. Well, the Aston... Steph Dusseldorp coming in as the Aston came out. But now is going to be the interesting thing because in a minute we're going to have, just coming past uh, out of the commentary box window, I can see uh, Frank Stippler in the 33 car has moved into the lead. It's going to be slicks on this number one McLaren as well, which uh, is a sensible decision, really, considering how far down the order they are. 
but Stippler came across the line, did the fastest third sector of anyone in that race so far. Laurence Vanthor on wets did the fastest lap of the race. So this is going to be touch and go, but the crucial thing is, John, we've still got 24 minutes left, and surely it's only going to get drier. The McLaren coming out of the pit lane ran very, very wide. I thought he got so close to the barrier, the last vision of that car. Clearly it didn't catch it, but and he ran, well, again, just Fred Makovicki ran that white line, didn't go over it, but ran it. You can see how cautious he has been on those basically cold, slick tyres. Got to be sure that he gets round lap one, finds where the track is dry. Look, through turns five and six, dry as a bone, up the hill, then down into turn seven, dry as... Well, almost dry as a bone. Yeah, almost. Marcus Winkelhock then, he's our front runner on slicks. Our race leader, Frank Stippler, is on wets. But then we've got Winkelhock and... No, this 32 car then, Lawrence Vanthor, he's on wet tyres yeah, still, isn't both, he? So he's up Audis. in the third place. Yeah, both Audis went out on wet. So Audis are first and third now. The difficulty of a Porsche is that uh, Mulna Motorsports, who are running the car, are used to endurance racing, where pit stops don't really matter. So they're losing time in the pit stops. Let's hear from Oliver Jarvis. He's down in the pits. Ali, whose decision was it for you to go out on wet? Um, a miscommunication. Um, I called for slick tyres, and uh, unfortunately the radio didn't work. So we have to hope we can hang on in there. Um, I think here with the trees, the radio is quite difficult, but I really think the slicks will be much quicker now, so we have to wait and see. Well, Thank you. well we, uh, you were surprised that they've sent them out on wets, and ultimately it's, and the 32 car comes in, Vanthor comes in, he said, no, I can't do it, I'm not going to do it on the wets. Well, you've got 22 minutes, and, well, just about 22 minutes of the race remaining, as we see the Porsche and the McLaren. Number one, Fred Makovicki, the Porsche pulls out Matt Halliday as we go back into the pits. Second pit stop of the day and a little bit of a fumble around the rear of that car. Porsche sweeps past the McLaren and immediately is pulling cleanly away. Well, it's fair to say the Belgian Audi Club won so comfortably in Nagaro because they were the slickest team. They had the best strategy, the drivers all pulled together, they had quick pit stops, and that's ultimately what gave them the race wins. Today is a different story. All I can think is, is there a different word in German for slick, or is it just schlick? <laughs> well, quite possibly. We'll, we'll ask them after the race as uh, the Audi Club WRT heads out. Now, this is our battle for race lead now, isn't it? Because we've got Frank Stipper in the lead. Wave yellow flags, I think I saw down there. Uh, maybe I was just imagining things, but I could have sworn I saw a wave yellow flag down there at turn 12. Yes, one of the Aston yes. Martins was and pulled off spotted, yes. uh, up there. I presume that's going to be Andreas Zuber and Sergei Afanasiev's car because they've been struggling. But this is the battle for the race lead, and it's, only, it's not going to be too no. long, is it, before Winkelhock gets past? There's, there's no... Winkelhock is going to get past. Frank Stipper is a sitting duck. And you can see Stefano Tilly there, the look on his face. He knows that they've been stitched up. Uh, miscommunication, it's very unusual, but it does happen. And uh, the Mercedes on the slicks, the Audi on the wet weather tyre. And really, all my old Marcus Winkelhock has got to do is sit there because the pace of the Audi is just going to evaporate with its tyres. Already we can see it in the turn four, it's going to be a pass into turn four. Off line, on the wet line, nevertheless, still enough grip on those slick tyres. And you can see Mark Bessing absolutely well, he's happy with that. So Marcus Winkelhock takes the lead of the race. And uh, well, you can see Frank Stippler looking to try and find the wet patches to cool the tyres, but there aren't any no, left the, anymore. No, no, there are. They're in the pit lane. Get into the pit lane and put on a set of slicks. <laughs> so Marcus Winkelhock moves into the lead. This is almost turning into an absolute repeat of Alan Cole's performance last year. Third in the champ uh, third in the championship race in the opening round, and then a win in the qualifying race in Zolder. Stefano Telli shaking his head. He's uh, they're discussing as to uh, exactly whose fault the miscommunication was, I imagine. Well, I can see in the background Pierre de Basquet, not Pierre de Basquet, team principal at Audi, and uh, he's, his face is stolid. It's just they know that they have made an error. Whether it was a miscommunication, I can understand in one car, but not in both cars. And look, the they BMW now they all over him. the back. They've got to pit him because he's going to lose so much time. Frank Stippler surely will just go straight on now. And... Yes, into the pits comes Frank Stippler. So that means race leader, 38, Marcus Wengelhock in the Mercedes. Second place is the 18 BMW of Michael Bartels. Third position is the second Mercedes of Thomas Jaeger. And then it's Matt Halliday. So Jaeger and Halliday, how far apart are they? I 
think they're quite away because Halliday's only just coming out of the final corner now. So uh, Jaeger has crossed the line in third position. And finally, Matt Halliday nine comes across seconds. nine seconds. So I don't think that's going to be enough. Uh, if he can close in nine seconds in 19 minutes, then uh, he's even quicker than we thought. Well, he, he certainly is about a second a lap quicker on that last lap. 18 minutes to go, just literally under 19. It's, you know, nothing's impossible. You've got to get out there and do your best. I imagine Mark Bresseng is fairly satisfied. Let's find out. Mark, are you, as you can see, some people have made a bad decision with regards to tyres, but you've definitely gone with the right strategy. Yeah, uh, it was really difficult because my radio was not really working. I had just a minute before the pit stop, it starts to work again, and I was just shouting, slick, 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 slick. And, uh, but it did the right tyres on. Marcos is uh, doing a great job on the outside. It's really tricky still. But uh, I think it uh, looks good now. I was right, is Schlick is the same in the German. Car, an issue? No, 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 but I have to say it was a, a mistake from my... I was not expecting that they were breaking so early in the second corner, so I hit Oliver Jarvis, I think. So I, my apologies for that, but uh, luckily the Mercedes is like a tank, so it's just uh, the, the shiny is gone, but it's still working really good. Thank you. So down into the left-hander comes our new race leader Marcus Winkelhock the ex-Formula 1 driver of course it was in wet conditions that he took the uh, plaudits for leading the race in the spiker in 2007 at the Nürburgring after everyone else had slid off and it's another tactical tyre change that has helped them today what's going on here with the Ferrari well, they put wets on and they've had to take some slicks as we see someone getting out of shape it's the McLaren that McLaren's heading off the road isn't it yeah it looks like it's running a little oh, no, bit wider that's wide. Greg Rodemosier and uh, he's just been overtaken and just, I think, almost overwhelmed. Running wide at turn 12, it was a bit of a Rosberg moment, wasn't it? Could have been 17 minutes ago. Look at the sky behind the pits. It is black. Yeah. So maybe the Audi decision to go on wet was premature. Yeah. They should have changed to slicks at the, the regulation time, but they may all find themselves back on wet weather tires before this race is finished. Yeah, if it rains now, we're going to have some fun, aren't we? So, Fred Makovicki i got to say, the McLarens, very impressive all of a sudden. The, the number one car is, I mean, the fifth position in the hands of Fred Makovicki. Well, I mean, this is what I would have expected of a McLaren and of the Hexus yeah. team running it, because the two operations, McLaren and Hexus, are both top of their game. Now, the next story to watch out for is that BMW is being closed in by that Mercedes. It's Michael Bartels in the Vita for One racing team car, who is ahead of Thomas Jaeger in the number 37 machine and he took out four tenths of a second on that last lap. Now we've got the two Audis battling. Well, we saw them battling over the lead in Nagaro. Now it's over 10th position, and they are behind a back marker, but we go on board with Lawrence Van Thor as he faces Frank Stippler on the run down into turns five and six. So this is the battle over 10th place. Well, the local boy, Lawrence Van Thor, he will want to use this opportunity, and it makes a small adjustment down. I can't work out what he's doing on that control panel in the centre of the ID R8 but coming through turn 7 down into turn 8, 9 and 10 and uh, a little bit of diversion reaction there Indeed, maybe that's what the Audi team were concentrating on when they should have been focusing on getting the right tyres on their R8s there is Oliver Jarvis He's uh, well Mark Basseng's come to pay a visit and, uh, and apologise actually it looks like it, he's apologising for that little tap at turn one. Yeah, and, I mean, notice that on the Mercedes but interestingly both drivers stating that they had problems with radios not wasn't just the case yeah. of the Audi it was also Mark Bessang but he managed to get that message, vital message through at the most important time So the Audis exit the final corner at their home circuit and they are really going to be struggling because there's not that many um, and Maxime Martin is in front of them actually so Maxime Martin in that Aston Martin I casually assumed it was a back marker but now the timing screens have updated themselves Maxime Martin in that number 7 Aston Martin is pulling away from the Audis uh, behind him by something like two seconds a lap on that last well, on that last Frank Stippler somehow or other managed to lose the best part of two seconds we can't see why but certainly his young teammate in the second of those two cars clearly keen to get ahead of Frank Stippler, looking to make a move down the inside, up into turn five, but just again, the momentum isn't there. It's a good place if you can get alongside, but if you're not, just forget about it. Up the hill, and then down the crest through turn seven, 
and Laurence Vanthor in his first ever race at his home circuit uh, is not having the best of times. He himself has uh, driven pretty well, it has to be said. Frank Stippler taking an awful lot of the inside at turn nine. Again, everybody's got to be aware they're told in the driver briefing that they seem to be using too much of what is not considered racetrack. They could be penalised. And Stippler was pretty much all four wheels in the middle of turn nine, not on the racetrack, but on that bit of concrete that, curb, that they soon call a curb. There is the number one car. Fifth place, Fred Makovicki. He is ahead of Nicky Mayer Melnoff in sixth position. And I think, well, actually, Nicky Mayer Melnoff set the fastest lap of the race a lap or two ago. A one minute 31.8, which is for half a second quicker than Fred Makovicki in front. So this may well not be over the battle for fifth position as well. Matt Halliday, I think, is fairly comfortable in fourth place. And uh, also, the gap for second came down by seven tenths of a second on that last lap. So we've still got battles to be resolved right the way throughout the order at the moment. But this BMW that was driven by Matthias Lode and I by Nicholas Mayer-Mayhoff is closing down. And uh, this is probably of the season so far. We're only into the second round, but third race. And this looks to be the best we've seen of the young German in the BMW. Yep, Nicky was really enjoying the uh, the circuit, he was saying earlier on. First time here at Zolder, really enjoying the flow that this circuit brings. Also enjoying the flow, no doubt, is Marcus Finkelhock out in the lead of this race and slowly being chipped away, though, actually. he uh, Initially, he was pulling away, but actually, in the last few laps, as you can see, well, no, it was only two tenths of a second the, the first two laps, but then the last lap, 1.1 seconds. No, I mean, Marcus Winklehock has been reeled in as if he had a 50-pound braking strain line attached to the back of that Mercedes-Benz, just reeling it in, and he hasn't broken the line back to being too aggressive. So, it looks as though the top three are pretty much all closing in on one another then, because the fastest man, two seconds quicker than his teammate on that last lap, Thomas Jaeger, who... Uh, was in turn one second quicker than the guy in front of that BMW. There you can see, or eight tenths of a second to be precise. And then a second quicker than Marcus Winkelock in front. So these three may well concertina up in the last 12 minutes of this race and we could have a grandstand finish for the qualifying race win. Remember, there are a few points up for grabs in the qualifying race, only for the top six, but the main thing is to set the grid for tomorrow's all-important championship race as Fred Makovicki sets the fastest lap of the race. I mean, what's so strange in this race is that Marcus Winkelhock has got a comfortable lead, but he's being reeled in by the BMW and the Mercedes behind. Hard to understand what's happening. Let's hear from Nicky Pastorelli. Nicky, can Thomas take Michael? I hope so. Uh, it looks like it. He's quicker now. Uh, we gambled a bit with the setup. We didn't go to full wet, so we struggled a bit in the beginning when it was wet. But now that it is dry, we are really fast. So he's pushing, and we will see where we end up. Thank you. He certainly is pushing. The gap between them is now down to just six tenths of a second as they cross the line that time. And Thomas Jaeger can smell a victory here at the moment because uh, what is also going to be interesting with these, this inter-team rivalry that all teams are going to have to uh, encounter, but one teammate needs to assert their authority or on the other set of teammates so that if there is any preferential treatment coming into the latter stages of the season, one particular pair are going to be favoured. Yeah, but if your boss happens to be the driver of one of these two cars, <laughs> the boss is going to have the first shot, but most certainly the last shot. But just to go back to what Nicky Pastorelli was saying about the car set up vis-a-vis -vis the lead car with Marcus Winkelhock and the third car with Thomas Jaeger, they've gone to the dry settings on that third car. What that means is the car is able to use the extra grip that the dry weather tyre has more efficiently than the car that's leading, which is on the softer setup, which is the more compliant setup to make the car easier to drive in wet weather conditions. But getting past that BMW, our Michael Bartles is up for it. He wants a podium. He doesn't want to give up second place. And also, you've got the battle of the two German giants, BMW and second place Mercedes, first and third. Now, the good news for Marcus Winkelhock is now that Thomas Jaeger is up behind, still looking happy, Mark Basseng, not looking too dissatisfied. No, but that, no, the BMW is, is, is his ally here. He's banking yeah. on that BMW holding up the second Mercedes Benz. He's, he'll be out there applauding the driver, <laughs> Michael Bartles. <laughs> so, but uh, because all of a sudden, Thomas Jaeger's lap times have dropped off by a second. Now he's stuck under the rear wing of Bartels. He needs to get past and fast. That's what I'm saying. That's why Mark Massey so happy. Yeah, exactly. You know, he's singing great. Michael, you're doing a good job. You know? Exactly, exactly. So there is the race leader, Marcus Vingelhock. The gap is 1.9 seconds. It came down 
by another three tenths on that previous lap. And the key for Thomas Jaeger, if he wants to win this race and challenge his teammate, is to get past that BMW as soon as possible. Thomas Jaeger in the SLS was uh, third in German Formula 3 in 1999, so he's another driver with very good single-seater experience and has been doing bits and bobs with Mercedes for the past few years. Just interestingly, uh, Jack, further down the field in 13th place, we haven't seen them at all, is the, the Melander Ferrari. It's now fastest in sector three, I think it might have been. So the Ferrari also in these dry conditions coming alive, whereas the, the wet conditions, the thing couldn't have driven out of its own way if it had tried. <laughs> Absolutely, so we've got eight and a half minutes to go and it's down to 1.7 seconds, the gap at the front, another two tenths of a second this time, and here we have Enzo Eid making his way past uh, the only remaining Lamborghini, oh, but then going wide, splashing through the puddle on the exit, and he loses the position once more, and that's going to cool his tyres down. And kids watching that overtaking manoeuvre, that's the way you don't do it. That was Darrell O'Young, he was challenging for seventh position. Into turns five and six once more, eight minutes to go, and Thomas Jaeger is unable to really attack. The gap at the lead is just 1.7 seconds. There's only uh, a shade over two seconds separating the top three at the moment. Matt Halliday is... Uh, Matt Halliday actually could be in trouble because Fred Makovicki in fifth position is all of a sudden 1.6 seconds behind. And taking a second or so out per lap, there's Yelma Berman. Can he... Will he be second or third on the podium? Those are looking like the two options at the moment with seven and a half minutes to go. Well, I think if there's going to be a second place for the Mercedes, there's going to be a real dive down the inside. Seven and a half minutes of the race remaining. There's a possibility into turn 15 and 16, but the Mercedes isn't sufficiently close to the tail of the BMW. He could have another run coming out of turn 15 and 16, coming onto the pit straight. But again, the BMW is just on the throttle that little bit earlier. But you never know, it only takes one little slip of a curb, and that would put the Mercedes right in the pound seat. Or I should say the Euro seat these days. <laughs> Michael Bartels in that BMW, very experienced racer, of course. 1986 German Formula 4 champion, he's twice won the FIA uh, well, he won the FIA GT1 World Championship in 2010, but was also FIA GT champion in 2006, 8 and 9. So uh, he even raced a bit of Formula 1, but is this what's happened? The race leader, Marcus Winkelhock, is slowing, and all of a sudden, Michael Bartels leads, and Thomas Jaeger is second. Absolute catastrophe for the number 38 Mercedes. Marcus Winkelhock appears to have some kind of problem, and he is now dropping backwards. This is now the battle for the lead, but what has happened? Well, it just suddenly, coming out of turn four, the lead car just stayed on the left-hand side of the track. The BMW had to move very rapidly to avoid running into the back of it. And uh, in the meantime, we've still got Thomas Jaeger putting pressure on the lead now, the lead BMW of Michael Bartels. It's strange, we need to find out what went wrong with Marcus Winkelhock, whatever it was, pretty serious. So, with six minutes to go, the battle for the lead is now separated by only three-tenths of a second. This is going to be... A grandstand finish to the qualifying race here at Zolder. Where is Winkelhock? Is he still? He is still cruising around. Will he come straight into the pits? We think he has a puncture. I didn't. It didn't I couldn't spot that from uh, from the way we were looking at it. But no doubt he'll pull into the pits soon enough. But five and a half minutes to go. We are watching the battle for the lead. The Vita Vaughan Racing Team battling it out with Al Inkle.com Munich Motorsports. Can't be a puncture. No, but he's still going. Down. So whatever the problem was, it may well be again within the car, either an electronic problem or um, it's not very much. You can so that I, frankly, right now, I suspect the guys down in our ankle are scratching their heads and saying, this has never happened before to our Mercedes, so we have to wait until this race finishes in just over five minutes. Yep, five minutes to go. The Al Inkle team ready and prepared, but at the moment that uh, 38 car is staying out there. We'll have a look and see what his first sector time is like. He's uh, not too far ahead of Matt Halliday all of a sudden. Here he comes, first sector, 32.5, three seconds off the pace. But here is Matt Halliday coming under immense pressure now from Fred Makovicki on the run down into turn five and six. Little look to the inside from the McLaren, but the Porsche holds on. And surely 
this will very soon become third position, the battle over the final podium position. I think the big advantage that Porsche will have is its initial squirt out of the lower speed corners. Overall, in lap time, the McLaren may at this point be the quicker of the two cars. But look at the way the car finds and how stiff the front of that McLaren is. So if, as long as Matt Halliday can keep it behind in the twisty bits, on the straight bits, the Porsche probably can consolidate. But the Mercedes still pushing Michael Bartels in that lead BMW. So the race win is up for grabs, and it looks as though the final podium position is up for grabs as we go on board with Fred McEvicki out towards the final sequence of corners at turns 15 and 16. The number one, Hexus McLaren, starting to perform how we expected it to, frankly. And 31-year-old Fred McAvicki is really pushing, almost running onto the grass on the exit of the final corner as they come across the line. Three minutes and 40 seconds to go. How far are they? They're four seconds behind Marcus Winkelhock, lapping five seconds a lap quicker. So before too long, that's going to come into play. Well, look how much McAvicki and the McLaren can close the Porsche down into turn one. But when you get onto the straight bit, you saw on the pit straight the Porsche was able to pull the gap on the McLaren. Nevertheless, that 3.8-litre twin-turbo V8 engine in the McLaren produces lots of grunt, but the Porsche has got the torque, and that's what gets it off the corners. And look at that, he's right up with Mike Parisi as they head down, uh, sorry, I should say Matt Halliday, as they head down to turns five and six. So much more grip through turn four, and is that going to be where the McLaren is? Uh, well, it's clearly where the McLaren is strongest, but is that going to be where the move makes? Bouncing all over the shop over those curves. Well, you can just see the McLaren, the stiffness of the car, but also the, the integrity of the design of the chassis is also so stiff. If we go back to the battle that uh, was going on for the lead, but now this is the battle for an effect for place. But there's Marcus Winkelhock, only a few moments up the road, and here's the battle for the lead. They are still, it's pretty much the same as it has been for the past five, six, seven laps up at the front. And here's an almost contact coming down into turn 12. Makovic is so much stronger through the corners, but that Porsche has the advantage down the straight. Look at it edging away ever so slightly, and then quite comfortably actually into the final corner, but they're closing in on Marcus Winkelhock. How is Winkelhock going to behave? Is he going to let them through or battle for all he's worth to hold on to this podium? Well, we don't know what the problem oh. with the Mercedes is, but you're all the Matt Halliday's got to do is plonk that Porsche on the bit of real estate that Fred McAvicki and the McLaren wants to buy, and uh, he's got that job done. It's going to be difficult for McAvicki. He's got maybe one more opportunity, and that may come with this Mercedes. Well, the Porsche's gone the long way round, but he's not getting past. He will get past on the exit, and the McLaren sweeps through just before turn three. Has to get out no. of the throttle, and that might be it all over for McAvicki. He was when he's done the inside into turn four. Yep, so McAvicki may well have just lost the opportunity to take the final podium position potentially and also don't discount Nicky Mayer Melnoff who all of a sudden is feeling very racy and sends one up the inside of Marcus Finkelhock moving up into fifth position so these three cars battling over the final podium position we've, uh, we've, they've lost communications with the Mercedes apparently so they have no idea what is wrong with the 38 car of Marcus Finkelhock perhaps that suggests some sort of electrical problem which may encounter the radio as well but with a minute to go, this is the battle for the lead. Yelma Berman can hardly stand still as he watches Michael Bartels turn through turns 15 and 16 to start what will surely be the final lap of the race. We wait for confirmation to see is this going to be the final lap? Comes across start, finish line. No, yes, final lap. So, to be fair, Thomas Jaeger is further back than he has been at any previous point. Seven tenths of a second. The McLaren is straight onto the back of that Porsche. This battle for third place is by no means over. Matt Halliday really starting to struggle now as they head down the start finish straight. The thing that Matt Halliday needs to do is actually slow down in the middle of that last game to force Fred McAvicki off the throttle so that he doesn't get the momentum on the run. Might have a chance into turn two, coming out of turn one. Up the inside, is he brave enough? No, and he's not, and he's wise enough not to make it. Has another chance into turn four. Needs a really strong runoff. Has he got it? He's closing to the Porsche, but not really... Well, he's going to have a look, but not close enough. He thought about it, didn't he, I yeah. think, because he, uh, he's going to be stronger. The was there, but the car wasn't able to follow him. He's right up behind the Porsche now. Is it just going to be... He's got a very good run. Is it just going to be a lunge at some point from Fred McAvicki? He's a very experienced driver. He's not going to do anything daft. He needs to be careful, though, because... Uh, Right up behind him is Nicky Mayer, Melnoff in that second Vita for One racing team, BMW, who are having a very strong weekend because here is our race leader, Michael Bartels, team boss of racing for One, Vita for One racing team, I should say. 
and Yelma Berman watches on as his teammate for the final time makes the run down into the final sequence of corners here at Zolda through turn 15 through turn 16 and we weren't expecting it at the start of the race but a brilliant drive from Michael Bartels and Yelma Berman gives them the win in the qualifying race here at Zolder and it's side by side for third position into the final corner any one of three cars could be in the final position on the podium the McLaren sends it up the inside he's not close enough Matt Halliday holds it all together into the final chicane is there going to be an out dragging from the BMW across the line no so it's third place for Matt Halliday fourth position for Fred McAvicky, great news for Hexus and McLaren. We'll probably get onto that later. Sixth position, uh, sorry, fifth, I should say, for Nicky Mayer off Sixth for Marcus Winkelock. Here's the battle over seventh on the final lap. Darrell O'Young has got past Enzo Eid, but Eid is looking back up the inside into the chicane and takes it on the final corner of the race. Gets it stopped in time. Good racing there. Fantastic pass by Enzo Eid. He did what he had to do. He's the only person who's been brave enough to shoot it down the inside, and he gets that position, and, and it's thoroughly well earned. That was actually Tony Volanda in the three car. So actually, that uh, that's Volanda down in 13th place. So that was actually Volanda just unlapping himself. Great racing, nevertheless. This definitely is a battle for position. De Moustier is going to finish 10th just ahead of Frank Stippler. Across the line, they come. So, uh, so Daryl O'Young uh, does in fact finish eighth behind Enzo Eid, but we thought that battle between was between him and a different Ferrari. And now Laurence Vanthor is going to come across the line after a very disappointing race for the Belgian Audi Club Team WRT. Pole position uh, for the Oliver Jarvis 33 car, but it didn't work out at all for them today. No, I did miscommunication radios again being problematic so the certainly the Frank the, the, the Frank Stipper all of a Jarvis car there is the Mercedes that did lead this race pulled off at the side of the track finally whatever the problem is uh, well we have to wait until they get back to the pits and explain it to us they're still gonna have sixth position for the championship race tomorrow so it's not an unmitigated disaster for the Mercedes but the beat of one racing team are going to be more than satisfied with a win and a fifth place for Nicky Mayer Melnoff and Matthias Lauda after a, a very topsy turvy race here at uh, Zolda. You were never quite sure who was going to win that one. It could have been any one of six cars, probably. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm delighted we've had all this mix and matching on the racetrack. The last thing we want to see is one dominant drive yep. from one driver team pairing. Uh, we've had a great race here with lots of excitement. Wet track to start with, difficult conditions. The decision at the pit stop window to go on to wet or go on to sticks really was a bit of a no-brainer and it should have been sticks automatically. If at worst you go one on one, that would have been excusable. But send in the case of Adi, both cars out on wet tires. One had a miscommunication, we understand. That doesn't explain the second of those two ideas. No, that's uh, that's very true. They both must have just the second one must have just made the wrong decision. Of course, we'll try and find out exactly how things transpired as pulling into the pits then is our race winning car Michael Bartels and Yelma Berman it was Berman who uh, was very strong in the opening part of that lap and Michael Bartels looking delighted and uh, let's hear from Michael Bartels and Yelma Berman Haley's down there get straight in there Haley. congratulations Yelma great stint by the both of you yes thank you thank you no, it was great. I mean, uh, in the rain, we were really quick. And then when it started drying, struggled a bit with the tires. But uh, Michael did a fantastic job. And uh, so uh, P1 now. But I have to hurry because I'm driving the Ferrari in the next race. So I have to leave. Thank you. So Berman and I might not even be on the podium because he's out uh, in uh, the next race, which I presume is something like the Dutch Supercar Challenge. But let's hear from Michael Bartels crossing the line as a race winner. Congratulations, Michael. What a great performance and a fantastic result for the BMW this weekend. Well, I was not sure in which position I was um, until the last five laps, so I saw P2 and then I became a little bit nervous. But um, I was a bit quicker than um, the car in front of me. It was the Winkelock, maybe, I don't know. Um, but the car behind, Jäger, was pushing quite hard. So, But in the end of the day, after a quite frustrating opening of the season um, first victory in the qualifying race but um, feels good feels back, good back on the podium thank you 
So Michael Bartels taking his third qualifying race win of his uh, FIA GT1 World Championship career. Of course, more familiar being on the podium with the Maserati MC12 that yep. the Vita team were so successful with, but now BMW Z4Ms. And again, we saw the potential of that car last year in GT3. Now it's happened in GT1. Let's hear from uh, Thomas Jaeger and Nikki Pastorelli. They're down there in the pit lane with Haley. Congratulations, Thomas. Almost both of you, both of the cars from the team are finishing on the podium, but sadly not for them. But for you, fantastic. Yeah, we're pretty happy because uh, at the beginning it didn't, it didn't look like we were very competitive. But in the end, uh, after the stop with the slicks, we were quite on a good pace. And I could follow the BMW, but it wasn't possible to overtake. But uh, I think it's a very good result already in Nogaro. We had a, a great first race, so we hope for tomorrow. And this is turning out to be quite a good track for you, Nicky. Yeah, hopefully all the tracks will be good for us. <laughs> but the car is definitely really consistent, especially during the race, so it's a really good result. Hope maybe we can do better tomorrow. Thank you. So second place for them. And uh, you didn't really gather too much frustration with, uh, with that performance. They were close to a win, but it's still front row of the grid for the qualifying, for the championship race tomorrow. Yeah, and obviously more important to get that car to the finish than make a blind dive down the inside and, and really get it wrong. Let's hear from Mike Parisi and Matt Halliday, delighted with third. Congratulations, Matt. A fantastic tyre strategy for you once again. Yeah, it was a shame. We qualified on pole and we got put back to fourth. Uh, now we're back to third, so um, it worked well. Uh, we struggled a little bit with the car at the end there. We had some, some issues, but other, it's been a tough day for everyone. You know, the conditions changing so much, so we're really happy to take our first podium can you do it again in the Trump championship race tomorrow uh, yeah we, uh, we are going to, uh, to start third now so um, it's a better position the, my start was quite difficult because uh, our setup was not for the beginning of the race so we were safe and um, the result is here so now we uh, we uh, our target is to go on the uh, top step, top top step, step. yeah top okay step. <laughs> thank you so congratulations to those two Exim Bank team China Porsches and how they'd very much love to perform strongly when we go to China in uh, August. I think end of August we go to Ordos and the Beijing circuit. Here's a look at the results then. The BMW winning ahead of the Mercedes, Porsche and McLaren. I'm not sure where McLaren's came from because they looked dead and buried both in at the start of this race and uh, but but things came to them the experience of Makovicki Dusseldorf they're good drivers it paid off I think really that like a number of cars they opted to go for a dry setup and yeah. that came to them once they track became dry enough for sticks and once they got the grip they could use the potential and you could see how much the McLaren could draw down on the Porsche on the twisty bits of the circuit just they weren't able to consolidate it when it came to the straight line squirt Marcus Winkelhock and Mark Basseng finished in sixth position. They did get classified but broke down uh, permanently on the warming down lap. They can see the Ferrari 458 Italia F, Corsa car, Tony Volander and Philippe Salacuada. Volander set the fastest lap of the race uh, with a 1 minute 31.166, but he made three pit stops along the way, so it really was a torrid afternoon for the Ferrari squad. Sadly, we lost Thomas Enger and Ren Wei. Uh, earlier on in this race. There you can see the 38 car has now been recovered back to the pit lane. Mark Basseng and Marcus Winkelhock discussing what happened in this race here at Zolder. Thomas Enger was looking happy that the rain had come because he was very strong. Peter Cox made a very fast start, a little bit too fast. He would later receive a drive-through penalty, but the whole of the field got through the first few corners very, very safely as we saw great battles throughout the order. Difficult conditions, though, on the opening lap, some cars were set up for wet conditions, as it turns out that some others were turned set up for dry. And uh, in the case of one of the Mercedes, you can see really struggling to get out of turn one without making contact. Yep, Nicky Pastorelli made it, uh, ran a little bit wide. Yelma Berman was soon on the attack. Uh, and there was a little bit of a, an off for the uh, number six machine, which was driven by Sergei Afanasyev at the time. But Yelma Berman definitely was the man on the move. Also on the move was Mike Parisi slicing through the field here, going past Thomas Jaeger when the circuit was still pretty wet as uh, the McLaren managed to make his way past both of the Ferraris in the end on what was a torrid day for AF Corsa. And then more battles as Parisi picked off Yelma Berman. It really was an impressive performance from him. And after the drive-through penalty that I mentioned earlier, Peter Cox was dropped out of the running and would finish down in eighth position. 
then came the pit stops and these were crucial. The race leading Audis deciding to stick with wet tyres which was uh, turned out to be completely the wrong decision and it was a simple task for Marcus Winkelhock to take the lead away much to the delight of Mark Basseng. Ferrari and McLaren continued their battles throughout the, uh, the afternoon. Enzo Ide there making his way past uh, Gregoire de Moustier. The battle was on for second place but ultimately it was the uh, race leader at the time Marcus Winkelhock who would run into trouble. You can see him there slowing that allowed Michael Bartels and Thomas Jaeger through and that order would not change before the end of the race. We had this great battle going on for the final podium position. Fred Makovicki not quite close enough to get past Matt Halliday. There were cars everywhere as he lost a crucial amount of time there behind that Mercedes. Yeah, on the penultimate lap, that was just the, the seal that the McLaren didn't need and the Porsche quick rut countered. Uh, McLaren couldn't use that momentum to make it stick and uh, they finished in fourth. So he tried to bully his way past it, didn't quite work. We're all set for an excellent championship race tomorrow, getting underway at two o'clock local time.